All right, now Genesis 33. You remember last week was uh, when Jacob was really struggling and you know internally he had this turmoil because he knew he was going to be facing Esau. Remember he sent the messengers out to tell him that he was coming and they responded and said, oh yeah, Esau's coming with 400 men. You know, he's thinking he's going to have this great battle. He's going to have this fight. So he was preparing all of these droves, all these animals that he was sending forth to be as gifts to meet Esau before he actually came to Jacob and his family. So he's sending out all these people in advance so that when Esau came, he would be met by all these people who were going to say, you know, this is, this is a present for you from Jacob to, to try to soften him up before he came up. And he wrestled with God. Remember, he wrestled all night. So now in chapter 33, we're going to see Jacob actually, you know, the confrontation between Jacob and Esau. So let's start looking at this in verse number one. The Bible reads, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came and with him 400 men. So this is what he's seeing. He's seeing Esau and all his 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. So he starts splitting his family up. And it says in verse 2, And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph Hindermost. Now, this isn't a mistake. This isn't in, well, this isn't in the Bible for no reason. It's showing us here, I mean, what other reason could there be that Jacob would put the two handmaids and their children out front and then Leah and then Rachel? Well, it's obvious because he cares the most about Rachel. We knew that from the beginning, that he loved Rachel. We saw that in the stories and the, the conflict between Leah and Rachel and, and how Leah was always trying to gain the affection of her husband. And just one more piece of evidence here shows you that, that how messed up things were that obviously we could see that Jacob didn't have as much love for the children of the handmaids. He put them up front. You know, so if anyone's going to get hurt, because remember, he's still thinking like, Esau might very well do me harm. And if Esau is going to do me harm, well, I want you know, these people up front and the one I love the most in the back to give her the best chance of being able to get away unharmed. Right? And, um, you know, it is what it is, but that's unfortunately one of the effects that goes along with this polygamy and having these polygamous relationships and, you know, taking his handmaid and having children by them. And it's also kind of interesting, too, that, um, you know, the, the sisters, Rachel and Leah, they wanted to have children by these handmaids, right, as like their own children. But the children weren't with Leah and Rachel here. They were with the handmaids. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that Leah or Rachel raised those children that they wanted to have because they were in competition with each other. Because that was the whole point. Remember, Rachel wasn't having children. God had closed her womb up. But Leah was having children. So Rachel gets this idea, well, if I can't have children, then I want you to have my children through my handmaid. That was her thinking. So she gave her handmaid unto Jacob, right? And then Jacob goes in unto her and she, she has children. But... I, I highly doubt, and we could kind of see that here, that Rachel was actually just raising those children. I bet the, the, the actual mother was still raising those children. And at, even at this point, he's separating the children to be with those individual handmaids that actually bear those children. And then he has Leah and her children, and then Rachel and Joseph in the, in the, at the very end of the group. But let's keep reading here. In verse number three, it says, And he passed over before them, and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So he puts them all behind him. He goes out front. Obviously, he's not a coward. He's not hiding behind his, his wife and children. He goes out in the forefront to meet Esau. But the way he has it planned out is that, hey, they can all escape. And hopefully the one that he loves the most is going to be able to get away. Even you know, Obviously, he'd want all of them to get away. But he, it, this shows and demonstrates his care and, and the order in which he cared for his wives and children. So, all the way up to this point, Jacob is in turmoil. He's, he's, he's troubled. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He sees 400 men with Esau. The last time he saw Esau, Esau was, said he was going to kill him. That's the last he heard from him, is that he wanted Jacob dead because of the blessing. So, he goes before him. He bows himself down seven times, just really humble. He sends all these humble messages. He sends all these gifts. And then in verse 4, it says, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
and they wept. So it was obviously a very good reunion. He comes back. What a relief, right? Put yourself in that situation for, what, for a minute and just think about him, you know, worried about his family, worried about all this stuff, worried that you know, Esau is going to come and kill him. He comes with this, essentially with an army with 400 men. The whole time he's got to be thinking and, he, and he's going through all this preparation, you know, all these different plans, and he's stressing out over it, and it all turns out to be just fine. Right? It, all, it all boils down to be no big deal. He embraces them. He kisses them. And think about times, you know, you can think about times in your own life. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Obviously, we're going to be coming back here. Think about the times in your own life where you may have been faced with problems or troubles or, you know, you're in the middle of a situation. You don't know how in the world you're going to get out of it. You think at the time it's the worst thing that could happen. You don't even know how you're going to survive. You know, you may be... be um, very concerned and preoccupied. Maybe you're having financial problems and you're saying, I don't even know how I could get through this. And you're trying to make all these preparations and you're going, undergoing tons of stress. But then at the end, whatever it is you thought might happen doesn't end up happening, right? I mean, he thought that Esau was there to, to kill him and do him harm. None of that even happened. And all this preparation, all this stress turned out to be for naught. He didn't really have to do that. And, um, you know, I know I've been through, I'm sure probably everybody here has been through something similar where you get all worked up and all upset and, and, you, and you're just focused and really thinking about something bad that's going to happen, but then it never ends up coming to pass. It just totally blows over or whatever and things are just fine. And, um, you know, we could learn from these events and hopefully, you know, the, the older you get, you start to realize that, it's oftentimes not worth all of that stress and all of the, the, the worrying over this stuff and the fear. You know, Jacob feared. He, he honestly was legitimately fearful of his brother. And I'm going to get into that in a minute, but let's look at Romans 5. Look at verse number 1. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Because the, the, the tribulations that we face, these trials, these, these, these bad times, you could call them, where we're, where we're struggling and and we've got a, a lot of things that we're worried about, it actually, will, it actually helps us. Look at verse number 1 of Romans 5. The Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So he says, you know, the more trials and tribulations that you face, it works patience in you. Why does it work patience in you? Because it says in patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So we start to learn to not get so upset right away. You start to learn to be patient with things. The more trials and troubles you face, the more problems that come your way, it teaches you that, hey, well, especially when you've been this before, it says, and patience, because patience brings experience. Right? So the more, the more problems you face, the more times you go through things, you start to gain confidence. You can look back on your experience. You know, the first time something happens, Everything is just a big deal. You're probably really stressed out. You don't know what's going to happen. You might have some fear. You might have all this other stuff. But then, you know, maybe something similar happens again when you realize, okay, it was, it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Everything turned out okay. You can go through these problems again and again. And, you know, personally, I could think of an instance with our first child. Right? There's a lot of unknowns. When we had our first daughter, you know, there was a lot of nervousness. There was a lot of stress. There was a lot of, well, we don't know how this is going to work. We were doing a home birth. You know, my wife had had some, some previous injuries, so we didn't know how that was going to impact the baby coming out with her hips being broken, all, this, all these things coming up. And then with, the, you know, with family members being there, not everybody's always supportive of you doing a home birth. And you've got, you've got people coming at you from all, all sides. And then she's in labor and her water's broken. It's been all this time has gone by. All these hours, all these days have passed and, and the contracts start to slow down and we're thinking, what in the world is going on? You know, and, and what a bunch of turmoil that we went through. 
a lot of tribulation, a lot of stress, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear going on during that time. But, you know, praise God, everything turned out okay. We did end up going to the hospital and getting induced, but she ended up having a baby. Elizabeth was just fine, and, and we got through that, and we got over that. And then looking back, we had learned a lot about what we did and, and maybe had some unfounded fears and some things that were causing us a lot of problems and also things that can cause you to make poor decisions if, you're, if you get too fearful based on what's going on. And, but then after she was born, then, then we have that experience behind us. And then we've gained more patience. So then when the next one was coming around and she's going way past her estimated due date again, as she did with the first one, we start to think, well, okay, you know, this has already happened to us before. It's not as stressful. It's not as much of a concern. We can look back and, and we, add, we have more patience. We're not as, as worried about why isn't this happening? Why isn't, you know, what's going on? What's wrong? Now it's not as much of a what's wrong. And then by the time we got to our third one, well, now we're just planning for it, right? And then by the fourth one, we have everything planned out <laughs> as being like, well, this is what happens. We've been through this three times before. The, the, the worry, the concern has gone away. Obviously, we still pray that, that God's going to make everything go well. But, but when you go through events and you go through trials, they build on each other so you can, you can gain the patience. When you gain that experience, it brings, you know, the tribulation says work with patience and patience experience and experience hope. And the reason why you get that hope is because, hey, we've been down this road before. I know that it may be bad right now, but things are going to be just fine. I know, you know, we've been here. Uh, we don't have anything to worry about. We have the hope that things will be just fine in the end. And it says, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. But you look, jump back to that first, first verse. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to be at peace in our hearts. right? There may be trials and tribulations and things that we go through, but even in the midst of problems and, and things that come your way, God wants us to have an, like an inner peace, a peace in our hearts, that we can be trusting in Him and we can have hope in Him. And that's, you know, honestly, for as much fear and everything else that Jacob had, he still did trust in the Lord. He trusted in God's promises and it's evident. Now, he went through all, you know, he made all these precautions and he, and, he, and he went through all the steps and he separated his family and he sent out all his gifts and did all this stuff. But God ultimately was the one that told him where to go and what to do and he was in obedience to God's word. So, he didn't make the foolish decision of being afraid and saying, you know what, he's coming at with me, 400 men, I'm just going to, I'm going to go hide over here. I'm going to go do something else and then disobey God's word. He stuck with it. He stayed through it. He had that faith. And you know what? I'm sure it was a great relief when, when his brother came and gave him a big hug, right? As opposed to, to socking him in the face, he gives him a big hug instead and from that experience alone, he learned patience and experience and he got this hope. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 21. Because ultimately, we should be at the point, so hopefully you can get to the point to where you know you're doing what's right by God with your life. You know, and, and you know, not everything is always cut and dry. I mean, Jacob, we can look at Jacob's example and be like, well, God told him to do this. Right? So you could say, of course you should have more faith. But then like, you could take my situation and be, well, God didn't necessarily tell you that you should go and do a home birth, right? I mean, that's, so that's where you get more uncertainty when you start questioning, well, is this God's will or not? And um, you know, I believe it is. And I believe that, that even if there's a situation like that where you can say, well, it's not necessarily like a biblical thing of right or wrong. If you're doing what's right, and if you are in God's will, then I still believe that there's, there's all the reason to just to have that faith and confidence in the Lord that He will look out for you and He'll protect you as well um, when, you're, when you're doing um, what He is, has commanded you to do and what you can clearly see from the Bible. So you know what? I'm going sowing. I'm reading. I'm praying. I'm praying for others. I'm helping people out. I'm doing all these different things to, to just for God to be pleased with me. And... Um, 
you know, we could have that confidence that he'll be there for us. Now look at Proverbs 21, verse 31. The last verse in Proverbs 21, the Bible reads, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. So he's saying, you know, you can go ahead and, and prepare your horses and have all your armaments ready for war, but ultimately your safety is, is, is from God. It's of the Lord. That's ultimately who's going to say, you could have all the chariots and horses in the world, but if you don't have God on your side, you have nothing. It's not going to do you any good. And that's what the Bible says, if God be for us, who could be against us, right? If we have God on our side, hey, safety is of the Lord. And I can say, you know, I've got all these guns and, and dogs and other things to help protect my family and protect our house. But if God's not going to protect us, it's, it's all going to be for naught. You know, I'm not, I'm not against having, you know, this doesn't say anything about being bad, about, you know, having a horse prepared for battle. It's not wrong to, to have that. But ultimately, we have to, everyone has to understand, safety is of the Lord. Even if Jacob had, you know, 500 servants with him, he still needs to be relying on God for his safety and for his protection and not relying on his flesh and in, in the, in the, the physical things that he has. Look at, flip over to Proverbs 29 real quick too. Proverbs 29 verse 25 because what we don't want to have happen is, is get fearful when the trials come, when the tribulations come our way, when the challenges face us and start making bad decisions because we're afraid of what might happen. We need to have that full confidence and faith in the Lord that He is providing our safety. He is with us. We're doing what's right. And Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So he's saying, you know, when you're fearful, that's going to bring you a trap. It's going to bring you a snare. And one of the reasons is because you're going to be making poor decisions. And you're going to be snared. You're going to be caught up and trapped in that fear. As opposed to someone who, you know, you put your faith or your trust in the Lord. God will keep you safe. God will protect you and will be with you the whole way through. Let's flip back, if we would, to Genesis chapter 33. As we see here, Jacob definitely must have been greatly relieved at not having that confrontation. But he did what was right. Even though he did have that fear, he still went to God in prayer. We went over that last week. How the, the prayer that he made to God and, and bringing up God's word and saying, God, you told me to do this. And, I, you know, I don't know what Esau's coming at me with, but I need you to, to basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing, you know, he's, he was asking for God's protection. Say, I'm going to do what you told me to do. And this is the attitude that we ought to have. Even if things might be scary, you might, you might not know the outcome is going to be. Well, we can go through that and, um, and have the faith that God will take care of us. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 5 says, And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are, the, who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Now look at, notice even after this, Jacob is still extremely humble with Esau. Even after they hug and kiss, he's, you know, he's, he says, you know, God's graciously given him, he's given honor unto God and calling himself Esau's servant. He says, he's given to thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves because they were the ones closest to Jacob. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Again, he's looking for his grace and his mercy, and he calls it in the sight of my Lord, saying, You know, like, this is all for you. I just want you to be happy. This is all to, to find grace with you. So he's asking, you know, Esau's asking, you know, who, who, who are all these people? Oh, yeah, these are my wives. These are my children. You know, they come and they bow down. And then he's like, well, what about all this, all this cattle and all this other stuff I saw coming up? He's like, that's for you. That's so I could find grace in your sight. Verse 9, and Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. Esau's like, I don't need that. Like, like thanks, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing good. I've got, I've got plenty of stuff. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, 
because God hath dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. And he urged him and he took it. And this, is, this reminds me of like, you know, when you go out to eat with someone, a friend, and people are like, oh, I'll take the bill. Oh, no, 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 I'll take the bill. And, you know, like, no, 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 I'll take, let me take it. Let me take care of this. And it's back and forth of people trying to be nice and, and take on the bill. This is what was going on here with Jacob and Esau, where Jacob's saying, no, no, like, like, take this stuff. Esau's like, no, I'm fine. And Jacob finally urged him. And he's like, look, just take it. You know, and, and Esau finally takes his, his gifts and, you know, it was like, thank you. And, um, and that was it. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 12, it says, and he said, let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. So now Esau is saying, all right, let's get on the road. Let's head back. Verse 13, he said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender and the flocks and herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. So Esau's saying, all right, you know, let's go. Let's get this, let's, let's get this show on the road. You know, let's, let's get going. And thinking that they're all going to go together. But remember, Esau met Jacob with 400 men that were probably already, you know, I mean, they're, they're traveling real fast because they've got nothing else with them. It's just them. And Jacob's saying, well, look, you know, we've got the cattle. I've got these little kids. You know, we can't, we're not going to be able to keep up with you. We don't want to slow you down. I, I don't want to overdrive them and make them work harder because then I'll lose cattle. You know, the children aren't going to be able to make it. So he's basically saying, why don't you just go on, go to Seir, and then I'll just catch up with you there. And in verse 15, and Esau said, let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. So Esau's like, well, at least let me you know, leave some guys behind for you. And Jacob's saying, why? You know, there's no, there's no need for it. We'll be just fine. You don't need to leave, it, leave anyone hanging back with me. You go on ahead. You guys all go home. It was great seeing you, but we're just going to take our time in this travel. And, and you got to remember too, I mean, the journey, it's not like things are now. I was talking about this the other day when we were driving through Arizona. I was just thinking about this. You know, we've got these nice freeways and we could travel hundreds of miles in a, you know, a short period of time relatively. And I'm thinking, you know, to travel through the desert, like we're in Arizona, we got this desert and you've got these mountains and stuff. And I'm continually, when I go back and forth from work, I'm going down the mountain and up the mountain and I mean, in order to make that same journey without the, the conveniences of today, the paved roads and the vehicles and stuff like that would have been a much more difficult journey. I mean, just going through the, you know, the, the heat of the day, having enough water with you and supplies and, you know, riding on an animal or whatever to get down there, that would not be nearly as easy as it is today. So sometimes it's easy to forget how things were back then. And, and you know, he's traveling. He's like, look, I've got these kids. We've got, you know, this is... This is a continual thing. I mean, they're camping every night, right? I mean, they, they've got to just lay out and, and get their rest or whatever. It's not, you're not going home to a nice warm bed as they're making this long journey. But um, it was difficult. And there was always, there was a lot of challenges. But uh, so he tells them to go on ahead. Now, this is kind of interesting too, because he says, you go on. And he said, because he said in verse 14, until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. So he says, okay, you go back to Seir, which is where Esau was living. And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll just meet up with you. Just give me some more time. It says in verse 17, And Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. So did Jacob end up going to Seir? No. It says here he just, you know, and, and it kind of makes sense. You know, obviously he wanted to, to see his brother and, to make, and make things right with him. But at the same time, I don't think he really wanted to spend a lot of time with Esau. And Esau throughout the Bible, he's, you know, you look at the, the things that we've seen about him. He seemed to be kind of carnal when, when he sold his birthright. He had, he had these problems. Um, I mean, he was real angry with Jacob to the point of willing to kill him. He took those two wives that, that were of the heathen that he shouldn't have done. And... Um, 
you know, he's just he's not portrayed in a very good light in the Bible, not someone who's a good example of a godly man. And Jacob's got his whole family and everything else with him. He's probably he's probably thinking, again, I'm reading into this a little bit, so take it for what it is. But I'm guessing it tells us here specifically that he didn't go, you know, that he went to Succoth and he just, he built his house and he, he got his household established and built these booths and did everything else. And it never says that he actually went unto Seir to, to Esau. And what I get out of this is that he didn't, he probably didn't want to spend a lot of time. He wasn't like that close to his brother where he wanted to just be around him and have his kids around him and, and, and everything else where he was really happy and thrilled that they're on good terms and that Esau's not going to go and try to hunt him down and kill him. But at the same time, he's like, okay, well, you go do your thing and I'm going to go do mine. And he establishes his house here in, uh, in Succoth and built him in a house. Now, we don't know exactly how long he's here because then in verse 18, we see Jacob has kind of moved again. It says, and Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Paden Aram and pitched his tent before the city. So now he's, he's, he's pitched his tent outside of the city of Shechem. And he pitches his tent. And he, it says he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. So he buys this, this lot of land. He sets up his tent outside the city. And look at verse 20 says, And he erected there an altar... And called, it, and called it El Eloi Israel. So there he, he raises this altar unto God. And um, he's, a, you know, he's a new man. He's got his new life. He's, he's away from Laban. He's established his household. He's made amends with his brother. They're all on good terms. And now he's, he's willing to move forward as basically as Israel. He's no longer Jacob. Remember when he wrestled with God, God you know, he, he received that new name of Israel as a prince. Um, and here he, he dedicates an altar. We're going to see that the men of Shechem, uh, what happens in, in the next chapter next week with, uh, with his daughter and where he ends, when, where he ends up there. But, um, you know, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty short chapter. There's not a whole lot going on here. There's, we see the, the big confrontation and the relief that he receives when he, when he meets up with Esau and, and everything turns out to be just fine. And I think that's probably the biggest theme we can walk away from from this chapter is, is to not get too stressed out, keep our faith in God, know that safety is of the Lord, know that, that the tribulations that we do face, that we can enjoy. As we saw in Romans chapter 5, it says, um, we glory in tribulations. Why do we glory in those tribulations? Because that knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience is experience and experience hope. It makes you a better person to go through these problems and to, and to understand them and to get through them. Um, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us. I think that's the main thing we can walk away from here is that Jacob was doing what was right. He was listening to God. He obeyed Him even in the face of trouble and turmoil and in the face of possible death from his brother. And when Everything he saw looked that way. He still made it through and everything turned out to be okay. And it, in, 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 in hindsight, it looked like, well, I guess I didn't have to worry that much anyhow. That God knew what he was doing as God always knows what he's doing. We don't know there, when, the, when the time is right there necessarily, but when you look back, you could always look back and say God knew exactly what he was doing. He had it all planned out. There was no reason for me to fear to begin with. The fear was, was unfounded. And the Bible tells us not to fear what man can do unto you. We need to fear God. So we, you know, he, he shouldn't have even feared his own brother. Even with everything the way it was, just fear God and, and keep his commandments and do what he tells you to do, which is exactly what he did, and everything will turn out fine. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this story in the Bible, dear God, and I pray that you would please just help us as we have our own struggles and trials and, and times of problems, dear Lord, that we could learn to just rest on you and rest in your word, dear God, and know that, that you will provide our safety and, and you will see, you will give us ways to, to deal with all the problems that we have and um, that we can all have that, that proper hope 
of knowing that things will turn out okay when we do go through the hard times in our lives here, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.